loved one, we're here for bone soft tissue, malignant soft tissue lesions, or soft tissue sarcomas. As always, we're going to start with our standard disclosure. Um, same disclosure we always have. And as always, if you have comments, suggestions, recommendations, uh, stories about this, about my disclosure, I'm happy to hear them either through Twitter or YouTube. Um, and let's get right into it. So we have a lot of different things to cover. A lot of these entities, at least at first, will look very similar. Um, so don't worry if you have to go over this a few times. Um, sarcomas in general are not common, um, but they do like to test them. Case one. So what we have here is, well, it looks somewhat well circumscribed, uh, very cellular, and we're just going to go in and see what we have. So at about medium high power, what we start seeing is there's a decent amount of vessels. And how do we know their vessels are filled with a lot of red blood cells? And this is indeed a very cellular tumor. Uh, it looks somewhat fascicular. The pattern is maybe somewhat uh, herringbone. And what herringbone refers to is the clothing pattern where you almost have like an arrowhead type pattern where these parallel fascicles are going to be running at an angle to each other. Uh, this is definitely not storiform or world, and it's not patternless. Um, maybe I should say vaguely storiform, uh, sorry, vaguely herringbone pattern, um, because it's not super obvious. Okay, and if we go in a little higher, we have relatively long uh, cells, they're, they're fairly ovoid, some of them maybe a little more spindly. This guy's a little more spindly. You can see the pointed ends. Um, but this looks relatively monotonous. There's, you know, some, there's a neutrophil, another neutrophil. There's some lymphocytes hanging out in here. Looks like some vessels running through. So maybe some attribute of, uh, of a vascular nature. Um, but yes, very, very bland. As I said, to me, this doesn't have a patternless pattern, which would make us think of SFT or solitary fibrous tumor. Um, the vessels also don't really look um, staghorn or antler-like. Maybe you could argue that this one does. Um, but generally, they're brownish. Um, so I'm not thinking SFT with this. And of course, you know, maybe uh, it doesn't help that I know what the answers are, right, since I make the presentations. Um, but this is generally how you should go about looking at these cases. Unfortunately, we can't see too much of an edge um, because the leading edge is somewhat uh, helpful for discerning a lot of these lesions. Um, but we can see like maybe, there's, like there's, there's some collagen I don't know that I would call this necessarily encapsulated, but maybe it has some semblance of a capsule. Um, but hopefully you can appreciate that it doesn't really matter where I'm going. It all looks very similar. So, okay. Uh, so this is a fibrosarcoma. And I know um, maybe at least one person watching this is going, well, why sarcoma since it looks relatively bland? Well, the cellularity is far too much. Um, and as you will see, these lesions tend to be rapidly growing. Um, so this is the juvenile or infantile variant of fibrosarcoma. So obviously because it's juvenile or infantile, we are looking at children. Young children less than 10 years old. Uh, some of these will even have it present at birth, okay? So if you have um, uh, some sort of uh, tumor come in and you're looking at this as uh, a neonate, then things that come to mind this is one of those things, okay? Um, they are rapidly growing, uh, which also maybe will help some people think about the uh, association with children because children tend to grow very fast. This mass grows very fast. Um, it most commonly occurs in the distal extremities, so you want to think feet, you want to think hands, uh, lower legs, forearms, um, but it can also occur in places like the trunk or head and neck. Uh, 
Overall, this tends to be fair, per, fairly poorly circumscribed. <laughs> Come on in. Um, and it also tends to be very infiltrative. Uh, and like a lot of these lesions, it's going to appear fleshy or gray tan. It might be a little nexoid or mucinous. Ours is not. It's very, very cellular throughout the whole thing. And as you can see, that dense cellularity, the oval spindle cells, that herringbone pattern, which to me is extremely vague in our example. Um, we don't see necrosis in ours. There's not a lot of hemorrhage. If you notice, there, there might be a few areas where the red blood cells are extravagant extra visited, um, but for the most part they're all in the capillaries and uh, where they're meant to be and we don't have dystrophic calcifications. You shouldn't have pleomorphism. Uh, if you do, it should not be prominent throughout the entire lesion. And we did see some scattered inflammation. Um, you can see here, like here's some lymphocytes in there, and our case also had a few scattered neutrophils. You can see things that are hemangiopericytoma like or that uh, solitary fibrous tumor like pattern where you could have uh, the staghorn vessels, the, the somewhat patternless pattern. In those cases though you should see fibrin thrown by. So even though we have dilated vessels and you have this very vague pattern, uh, you don't have fibrin thrown by. So that's what you really need to pay attention uh, with that. Sorry, I'm just handing off the mouse so you guys don't have to just listen to me this week. Uh, stains, so okay, vimentin, and I can already hear groans about that. Um, so you don't have to do vimentin. It's very common across all the sarcomas, so is it necessarily going to help you figure out that this is sarcoma? Not overly. Um, the other stains don't help you a whole heck of a lot either. There's S100, C34, so your vessels, uh, CD68 and obviously keratins can be in there, um, but none of these are really a slam dunk for fibrosarcoma. The molecular uh, involves the ETV6 and NTRAC3, so that's your translocation 1215, P13 to 26, uh, and there's a whole bunch of things, and in the handout that I included with this, um, you actually can see that I included a list of things that, that include these translocations. So um, unfortunately, that's not something that's necessarily going to help you figure out that that's what this is either. So you're looking for a young kid, fast growing tumor, maybe this is even a baby, and very, very cellular, uh, ovoids is spindled, and not much else going on. Okay, your differential is going to make a lot more sense as we go through today. Um, some of these things we saw when we did our benign soft tissue, like the fibromatosis, so obviously that's a benign lesion, and um, same with the myofibromatosis. Uh, adult type fibrosarcoma is a little bit of a different profile, and uh, treatment for these, well, they're going to try and cut them out. Obviously, they're fast growing, so they can do radiation. Uh, for any residual disease or if they're worried about positive margins. Uh, and overall, this, they have a very excellent prognosis, which is great because we're talking about uh, tumors in kids, and mortality rate is less than 25% with very rare mets. Uh, what I have on the incest here, so on the top, there's a variant that can look where the cells look a little more plump, um, the chromatin's a little more granular, and below that, what we have on the left is you have the more plump cells with the granular chromatin, and on the right we see more of the spindled cells that we would expect to see. So that's your juvenile fibrosarcoma. Case two. Okay. Um, proliferation. Yes. Very cellular at this magnification. Maybe some well circumscribed areas here, but it looks a little more infiltrating here. Um, but it seems like we've got mostly tumor on this slide. Uh, zoom in now, just look at the cells themselves. Okay, so um, I see spindles, the proliferation of spindle cell. Um, they're kind yes. of elongated. The nuclei, there is an ample amount of cytoplasm, it could be retraction or that can't really tell off the projection very well, but um, looking around, um, there's no I mean, there's a bit of like, you know, it looks like there's a little looser here, a little denser here, but um, not really any necrosis or, you know, um, hemorrhage or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So just looking at the larger thing, like the nuclear features are not projecting too well. I'm just looking around looking for nuclear grade, if there's anything that's 
you know, since we're doing Malignant today, I <laughs> hope to see a little, like this, I'm really hoping to see a little more pleomorphism design right now. Maybe it's just the projection and not appreciating ah. the full breadth of this thing, but it could be a feature. Could be. However, not all sarcomas are pleomorphic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Scary. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm not seeing really any mitotic figures. Right. But, um, it is a spin the cell proliferation. So, I mean. Okay. Um, so, what about all this stuff that's kind of scattered blood throughout vessels? it? Blood Right, no. Mm -hmm. They're not blood vessels, they are. Yeah, that's collagen. Wow. Okay. Um, so yeah, there, there's a couple cool features with collagen with these cases. Mm -hmm. um, so what you notice is wherever you are, the collagen kind of runs along with the cells. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives you a better sense of maybe of, of a pattern to how everything's laid out. I think it's easier to see with this lesion than the previous one, if that's a good hint. You mean the general pattern of the cell streaming? Yeah. Like, kind of herringbone? Yeah, so very like, herringbone. So it's like, here's the bone, and here's the radiating things coming out. If you kind of like tilt your head, imagine a little squint your eyes, you know, maybe there's, you know, like it's like a fish bones coming out of the central Oh, spine. perfect, yeah. because I described the, the uh, pattern that we see in clothing, which is also herringbone, but okay. yes, same idea. The, the fish bones come, the ribs coming off of the uh, spinal column. So, yes. Okay, so what do you think we have? Well, it's like, it looks like a fibroblast proliferation because of the collagen and stuff. Mm -hmm. And since we're doing malignant, I'm going to put my money on fibrosarcoma. Okay. What type of fibrosarcoma? Well, I know that you won't put two together unless you want to trick me. <laughs> I'm going to do it one of these days. <laughs> one of these days, we're going to have like an unknown, unknown session. Yeah, but um, I'm going to go with adult. Okay. So, yes, this is adult, and the hint that gives you adult is the collagen, because we, we do not see that with uh, the infantile variant. Okay, so this is adults, so we're going to see it in middle-aged adults, so scrap everything you thought about uh, the infantile or pediatric uh, variant where um, they're going to be less than 10 for the adult variant, they're going to be between 40 to 55 years old, and there's a slight male to female uh, predominance, and that's not too surprising because most lesions that we encounter, unless they're uh, within the uh, female uh, reproductive realm and a few other exceptions with um, bone soft tissue, most of these lesions are going to be male predominant. Okay, what else? So they are going to be a single deep-seated palpable painless mass and uh, as you may recall from when we did uh, some of our benign soft tissue lesions, whether they're painful or painless can help you form a differential. But your sites are going to be extremely similar to the pediatric variant. Unlike the pediatric variant, which was not generally well circumscribed, this will be. Um, it will have the same fish flesh or um, uh, tan or gray. Soft con if it has a soft consistency, then what that means is that you're likely looking at a necrotic lesion. Um, and these arise from either the superficial or deep connective tissue depending on where you are and sometimes it can involve the subcutaneous tissue uh, so that just will complicate your differential a little bit and looking into um, uh, what the patient's history is and what the clinician's thinking. So there's multiple grades for fibrosarcoma adult variant whereas we noticed with the juvenile variant it was do they look more spindled or more plump. So grade one, uh, essentially you're not going to have any pleomorphism going on as we can see there. Um, however, most of this is going to be exactly the same as our juvenile variant except for those collagen fibers. And the collagen, as we mentioned earlier, should run parallel and uh, separate the individual cells. So it's kind of almost going to look 
like a scar. Um, you can see mitotic figures in this, but with variable atypia. Uh, and obviously the atypia, and uh, if you have any pleomorphism, that's going to be related to your grading. Uh, you can as well see the different uh, matrices. Maybe it's a little mixoid, maybe it has some necrosis or softening uh, that you would appreciate grossly. And then you can also see like chondroid or osseous metaplasia, so uh, bone and cartilage elements. Your stains, bimentin. You can grow now, because I said bimentin. Uh, and also very, very focal SMA. Uh, so again, it's not really going to help you. Molecular. Okay, so our juvenile variant had the NTRAC uh, translocation. Mo the molecular for adult fibrosarcoma is a lot simpler. There isn't any. Uh, so here on the right side, you can see that I have some grade 2 and grade two, 3. So grade 3 obviously just being a lot more pleomorphic. Grade 2 kind of being somewhere in between grade 1 and grade 2. Uh, your differential, um, so obviously we're going to add a lot more things into that, um, and because it almost had like that, that biphasic type feeling in the case that we had, which um, the paler areas just had a little bit more of a mixoid component, which is something that this is allowed to have, so you can see where they would think about things like, oh, is it synovial sarcoma, is it low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma? Um, and, and those kind of things. So again, as we go through this week's lesson, you're, you're going to kind of see like why these things have very common differentials uh, and why at first they all look very similar. Uh, for treatment, you, they are going to do the same thing. So radical excision and they may do post-op radiation. Prognosis, five-year survival depends on your grades. So your lower grade lesions, 60% for five years. And your high grade lesions 20%, uh, which you know falls within what we see with other lesions when we grade them one, two, three. This is has up to grade four. Um, and you can also see um, metastases that will spread uh, hematogenously. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind. Okay, fibrosarcoma, adults and juvenile, and I know everyone who is watching this and looking at the slides will never ever ever get those mixed up. Um, how I remember it is babies haven't been around long enough to make collagen or scars, whereas adults do. So that's how I remember that, and uh, maybe that'll help somebody else out. Case three. Okay. Very um, mixoid sort of background mm -hmm. with a bunch of cells. Not very blue in terms of so, but it could be the stain. But um, there does be a very strong mixoid component to this. Um, not really well circumscribed, at least from the specimen. Um, so let's go on higher power and see what the tumor cells are. So looking around. So again, it seems like most of the cells are spindle-like within the lesion, but there's a big, very strong mixoid background mm -hmm. like more so it's kind of like more mixoid than cellular like sort of you get that impression yes so in this case i would say it's the one of the pair of very confusingly named sarcomas <laughs> um, okay. this is the fibromyxoid one because it's more mixoid i would say okay. um yeah okay um so very good there is one very vague histological feature of a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, and obviously uh, we have variants of those as well. Um, and I know I'm playing a little bit of guess what I'm thinking with you, um, but do you know what feature you tend to see with this tumor? Mm. I found one that I was like, okay, I can show you this. <laughs> just kidding. Um, nah, I don't know. Well, let's look over here. Does it have anything to do with like the sort of band-like structure, or it has to do with the collagen? Yes. Collagen. Mm, 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 mm. I don't know. That's okay. 
Um, so it's known for having this very poorly formed pseudo rosettes. Um, so if I go, because I annotated one, so oh, okay. let's just. Ah, so, you have um, on a different slide. That was, that was my <laughs> attempt. So if you want to zoom in on that. Um, so to me, it looks almost like a rosette because it's forming sort of. <laughs> Whenever they say poorly formed pseudo rosettes, I always go, okay, well, what exactly does that mean? Um, you have to use your imagination. Yes. Um, but okay, so that's what we have. So this is adult variant of low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. Um, so obviously affecting adults and uh, maybe our, our younger age adults with an average of 34 years old. And unlike our uh, fibrosarcomas, these are very slowly enlarging masses that are again uh, painless. So whereas uh, fibrosarcoma like to be distal extremities as well as trunk, head, neck, um, your low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma likes the proximal extremities. So you want to think, okay, is it in the shoulders, is it in the thighs, buttocks, trunk, as well as the head and retroperitoneum. And it's always terrifying when things go to the retroperitoneum. Um, so it's a good thing that that's last on the list. And uh, also a little different is that it's going to have this yellow, white, and glistening cut surface. And obviously it's glistening because of the myxoid component. Uh, you shouldn't see hemorrhage in these, and you should not see softening that would suggest necrosis. Uh, overall, you're going to have what we have in our case, which is you're going to have these areas of very densely collagenized areas that are very cellular, and then you're going to have these very loose hypocellular areas uh, with this myxoid stroma in between. Your spindle cells, which constitute this uh, lesion, are going to be very bland, uh, and it they call this a tigroid type pattern, where it has these very short fascicles in a whirling pattern. Um, it doesn't really look like tiger stripes to me, but um, you know, I also can't do those magic 3D eye images, so maybe I just don't see it. You shouldn't really see mitosis in these. Again, this is a low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, uh, and that is the full name. Uh, we're not uh, being cheeky by suggesting, okay, there's. Uh, this one is low grade and they're simply high grade. This is, that is the name. Um, you can't, you should see those poorly formed rosettes as I was mentioning and those are uh, dense collagen run by epithelioid fibroblasts. And you may or may not see increased cellularity or atypia and that occurs in about 10% of cases. So if you don't see it, don't worry about it. Okay, stains so by Menton. Um, if anyone's shocked at this point, Feel free to raise your hand or something. Um, you can also see things like Mach 4, which makes sense because of our mixed background. And again, very focal rare SMA positivity. Er, pretty much everything else you can think of under the sun is going to be negative. And as far as your molecular, so this one has a translocation uh, between chromosome 7 and 16, or the FUS CREB 3L2. And that occurs in almost th in about three quarters of these cases, so it's not necessary that you have to run molecular to prove that it has this translocation to say this is a low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. But if you did run, it would you would uh, expect to see it. Differential, so things that look a little more like fibromatosis and things that look a little more myxoid. That's basically what's in your differential. Um, but a lot more benign things than malignant things, and that's owing partially to the fact that it, it's relatively posicellular. Treatment, this is going to be uh, somewhat repeating throughout the, the session, is they're going to excise it, and they do post-op radiation for residual disease or positive margins. Your recurrence rate is about 10%, so that's actually not a bad recurrence rate, and 6% of uh, these cases will develop metastases but often these are very remote metastases, so they'll be years and years down the road. And only 2% of patients will die because of this disease, and that's likely related to the metastases. Low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, adult variant. Case four. Kind of looks like the other one a little superficially, very superficially. There is some myxoid component, looks like a little this maybe, uh, but more cellular. Um, not really well 
circumscribe kind of infiltrating. Um, higher power. Again, mostly proliferation of spindle cells. Mm -hmm. It does seem to, like the cellular do look very atypical. They're kind of big, kind of ugly looking. And I don't know what's going on here. It's a weird cell projecting, but anyways. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look benign. That's the first thing, which fits with today's theme. Yes. Um, <laughs> but it definitely is more cellular than, compared to the other ones, more cellular than mixoid. And I want to say it's the other side of the coin is the mixo fibro sarcoma. Oh, you found some of the. Oh, there's one, there's one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, giant, giant, giant cells. cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, this is mixo fibro sarcoma. Um, again, with bone soft tissue, they prefer to be a little more descriptive than anything else. So, as you said, it's a little more fibrous than mixoid, um, but even if you go into the areas that look a little more posticellular, you're going to see that those same atypical cells. Yeah. And so project as well, but I think they're there. They yeah, they're there. It's just not quite as much. Um, and you can also have some of the uh, pseudo lipoblasts in there. Okay. So we've gone through the whole age gamut now. So uh, fibrom <laughs> mixofibrosarcomas occur in elderly adults. So we've seen things that occur in babies, in young adults, middle-aged adults, and now this is for elderly adults. Um, most of them occur in the extremities, and uh, if they're superficial, they tend to be more multinodular and have a more of a mixoid component. Whereas if they're deep seated, they'll tend to be a single mass with very infiltrative margins. So given the overall look of the case that we had, it was very likely that's a superficial tumor. Um, and high grade lesions, so again, we go based on grading, uh, will have tumor necrosis. And obviously low grade should not. Um, microscopy, so we're gonna see multinodular, which we aren't necessarily able to appreciate in the example that we have. We did see a, a whole bunch of those pleomorphic spindle cells, and the mixoid background was somewhat more dedicated to certain areas of the lesion, but it was definitely there. You can see pseudolipoblasts. Um, so why are they called pseudolipoblasts? Well, they have these cytoplasmic vacuoles that blow them up so they look like they're lipoblasts, but they're actually filled with, with mucin and have more of a mixoid appearance. Um, you can have some solid areas, and that'll be more typical to your undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Uh, they have curvilinear vessels, which the case uh, that I put in this presentation for you does have curvilinear vessels. Um, and you will see that there's a little more uh, cellularity close to these vessels. Um, can't really appreciate too much of the fibrous septa, but again, we're, we're seeing a single snapshot of this case, not the entire picture. And we did definitely appreciate that mixoid stroma, and uh, one of the caveats is that it should encompass more than 10% of the tumor. Um, lots of immature dendr dendritic cells, and we cannot appreciate the margins in this case, so I really want to make that uh, apparent because these do have infiltrative margins, and it's very difficult to get uh, negative margins surgically, um, and they will have these long tentacles or almost like tongue-like projections uh, radiating out. You can't appreciate that in, in our case, and it, obviously I, I feel that that's just because um, we have a very small section of the overall case, so we, we can't see that. Uh, they can have rare epithelioid differentiation, and if you want to look at low grade versus high grade, well obviously high grade is going to be more cellular, it's going to be more atypical. Um, it can have necrosis, it can have hemorrhage, uh, and even though we did have some multinucleated giant cells, you can argue one way or another whether or not they were bizarre. Um, Grading with these lesions actually is quite controversial, um, and it doesn't really predict anything. So if you had to throw a grade on what we had, um, ours would probably still fall more into the low grade 
end of that spectrum, but again, it's controversial to grade these lesions, uh, so we just leave it at uh, myxofibrosarcoma and call it a day. Grossly, you can appreciate that these things are, have a, a high myxoid component. Um, they almost look like it's uh, pure mucin pools on the cut section that I have there. And then just a couple snapshots below to show, okay, we have our areas that are low more myxoid with these uh, occasional pleomorphic uh, fibroblastic cells. And then uh, you can have areas that are a little more cellular with increased uh, pleomorphism as well. Your stains, okay, bimentin is variable, but okay, bimentin. Mucin, so if you wanted to do uh, your MUC4 or um, mucic carmine, that would be positive in this. And CD34 would highlight those curvilinear vessels very nicely. Negative stains, so fat stains, um, and that's important if you were thinking about liposarcoma based on how it looks with the pseudo lipoblasts, um, as well as S100 negative. For molecular, these commonly have 6P deletions, 9Q gains, and 12Q gains, um, but often they have a complex karyotype. So what does that mean? Well, if you run molecular on these, uh, they're probably going to give you a, a mixed bag of different variations, and it's not going to tell you a whole heck of a lot. Um, with that said, though, the, the triad of the 6, 9, and 12 chromosome losses and gains, um, those are fairly commonly seen. So I would expect to see most, if not all of them, if you did run molecular. For treatment, Again, we're going to excise this and post-operation and chemo can be added in, uh, which makes sense. It's a little uglier than the other lesions that we've seen um, and elderly patients. So whether or not they would add in chemo radiation might also be dependent on the patient's uh, overall status. Prognosis, okay, so this has better prognosis than other undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas, so that's good. Um, but two out of three cases will recur. And when they recur, they're gonna have an increased grade. So if they start out low grade, they're gonna come back looking high grade. If they start out with no molecular, they're gonna come back with a complex karyotype. Um, so that can be terrifying. And a quarter of these are gonna have metastases either to the lung or bone. Um, so those are things that you wanna uh, be aware of. So we have another cross-section of another mixofibrosarcoma on top. And on the bottom, the one that I really want to point out is the bottom left picture where it has uh, that really bizarre multinucleated giant cell. So that's your mixofibrosarcoma. So we have all those down, our fibrosarc, low-grade, fibromyxoid, and mixofibrosarcoma. Moving on to lipomatous and myogenic lesions. Case five. Okay. It's infiltrating mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. um, gives me some fat. Actually, I think the money is here. Yes. And um, oh boy, what does this look like? It's just like a massive, nondescript, ugly looking cells at higher power. It looks like there's some large cells scattered about. Very high pleomorphism, I would say. Sort of. Am I just imagining things? No, oh, you're not imagining things. So, and it doesn't look like anything. It's just, it's a bad tumor. Um, yeah. It's a bad tumor. So, I think probably to differentiate it, maybe? Maybe. I don't, I don't know what this thing is. It's hard to tell what it is. Yeah. I, have, does a, see I have another example if you would like to see that. Yes, please. Oh, okay. Uh, muscle or collagen. Uh, that's I muscle. muscle. No, that's muscle. Ooh, okay. These kind of look like something. These are more like fat cells, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's like 
you look at this and let's say this is a lipoma, you're like, this is too cellular for lipoma. Because <laughs> usually lipoma, you're like, yeah, it's a clear slide. You know, nothing to see here, <laughs> move along. Um, but this one is different. And then you have this area that has some, it's very cellular and that's a little kind of big and centrally located for it. These do not like look like not look like normal fat cells. No. But well, I think some of them might be macrophages yeah. too, just to complicate things <laughs> even more. Mm -hmm. But like when you do see stuff with all this like sort of extra material, it makes you really concerned for a possible liposarcoma. That's like the first thing you should be on, you know, considering. Um, so you want to look for some those weird. Lipoblast like cells. Yeah, it might be easier if you go low power to look for an area that's yeah. maybe a little more alive. Alive, yeah. <laughs> so we're still alive. Ooh, there you go. There it is. Okay. Yeah. So I think this one maybe is a little easier to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll I know they kind of look like spiders sometimes if you catch they it. They can, uh, yeah. See, there's the head, the abdomen, and then the legs coming out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, these are both de-differentiated liposarcomas. Absolutely, um, it was de-differentiated. <laughs> was de-differentiated. The problem with de-differentiated liposarc, uh, as you will see as we go through, is basically it can look like anything. Okay, and this the cardinal rule of liposarcomas, de-differentiated liposarcomas, is that if they tell you, Retroperitoneal, it has to be in your differential. So if, if you have a, a retroperitoneal lesion and you're not thinking, could this be a liposarcoma, a dedifferentiated liposarcoma, you need to reroute your thinking and put that on, on the list. Um, and I mean, I know it says like any sarcoma, but as we'll see, um, these can be uh, very elusive. So they tend to occur in older adults, again, not too surprisingly, males over females, although only slightly. And uh, it occurs in about 10% of well-differentiated liposarcs, especially retroperitoneal. Well, uh, well-differentiated liposarcomas or atypical lipomatous tumors pretty much look like normal fat. Um, so this can be very scary and, and that's why I said like you really should be thinking about it like all the time. Uh, so sites, your, retroper your retroperitoneum comes up most commonly as well as extremities. You can get these in the spermatic cord. So not just lipomas of the spermatic cord, you also need to think about DDF liposarcs. Uh, rarely seen in head, neck, subcutis. Um, and I put a note in there to remember that subcutaneous uh, ALTs or, or well-differentiated liposarcs do not de-differentiate. So if you have uh, a subcutaneous, a very superficial ALT, and it's looking like it's de-differentiated, then you probably never had an ALT to begin with. Um, okay, and because these can involve well-differentiated liposarcs, they must be extensively sampled. Um, Overall, they're going to have that fish flesh appearance, so that's really not going to help us figure it out from other things. Um, they are often surrounded by well-differentiated components, so again, it's going to look very much like normal fat, um, with some slight variations, and those slight variations are kind of what you can see in the lower inset, or the lower picture, sorry, where you have atypical uh, nuclei with relatively large uh, adipocytic or fatty content in, in the cell. Um, they can be either nodular or very discreet. Um, they can have necrosis, and when you see necrosis, that's going to be in your more high-grade areas. Okay, getting into the, the low-grade dedifferentiated versus high-grade dedifferentiated. Um, the main difference is going to be the heterologous elements. And what does heterologous mean? Well, that means you're having uh, the presence or impression of tissue that shouldn't be within the tumor normally. Um, so whether that's 
neural differentiation, so does it look like a schwannoma? Uh, does it look like, do you have, um, well not does it look like, do you have elements of schwannoma in there? Do you have leiomyosarcoma, osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma? Okay, ba basically pick your favorite sarcoma and it can be in a dedifferentiated liposarcoma. So even if you were like, oh no, this, this whole thing looks like uh, a rhabdoid or alveolar rhabdoid sarcoma, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, there we go, use your words, Kara. Um, you still need to think about, is this actually a liposarcoma that has heterologous elements? So a liposarcoma that has an element of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, and that can occur. Um, so uh, we have a, a, a lot of writing in there that basically says, well, it can resemble uh, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. A lot of things can. Your undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, there's half a page on it in your handout. So if you look at the handout associated with this presentation, you'll see that. Um, between the well-differentiated and dedifferentiated components, it can either be abrupt or gradual. You can have mostly well differentiated, mostly de differentiated. Um, so there is an entire spectrum of these things. Now, uh, while I said that there's high grade and low grade de differentiated sarcoma, a low grade de differentiated sarcoma is uncommon. Okay, it's going to look more like fibromatosis or a well differentiated fibrosarcoma. So again, going back to our adult. Uh, fibrosarcoma because dedifferentiated liposarcs occur in adults, so uh, you'd want to think about the adult type uh, fibrosarcoma, and they tend to be non lipogenic. So, what does that mean? That means it's not going to look like it has fat cells in it. Um, and to give you something similar, uh, well differentiated spindle cell liposarcoma has a typical fat or lipoblast, um, and uh, a lesion that we went over when we did our benign session, or the bone soft tissue one week, was uh, looking at uh, spindle cell lipomas where they can either have all fat content and very little spindling, or all spindling and very little fat content. So this falls under the same spectrum. Hopefully I've harped on that enough. Uh, stains, so we have a lot more stains that can help us. So we're gonna just, you know, ignore Vimentin for a minute. Um, so your MDM2, that is gonna be your most helpful stain to figure out the differentiated liposarc. You can also use uh, CDK4, which is a very good stain to help you. And uh, the other stains are mostly to help you figure out that's not something else. Um, for molecular, you can see the molecular looks pretty darn complicated. Um, the most uh, important thing to look for, honestly, would be your 12Q14 amplification. Um, but there's a, a lot of other things to consider, and there's a lot of pitfalls with MDM2, even though I said it's probably the most important. That's why pairing MDM2 and CDK4 um, would be your best combination really for figuring out dedifferentiated liposarc. Uh, so you have a whole list of other lesions that also have MDM2 gene amplification. Uh, and for some reason, the sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma is uh, not in Sedna. But what we have up top is some imaging where you can see what it would look like on x-ray and then the gross specimen. And underneath, that would be an abrupt transition between the top, which is the dedifferentiated liposarcoma, and the bottom, which is the well-differentiated liposarcoma. Your differential, um, so even though this list doesn't look too long, basically any and every sarcoma ever discovered should be on that list. Um, your, anything that has rhabdoid differentiation is going to have a poor prognosis. Uh, looking at treatment. So they're not just going to excise this, this is going to be a wide local excision with clear margins and that's very important. And um, even though it has a better prognosis than our other high grade pleomorphic sarcomas, anywhere from 40 to 75 percent, so either half your patients to three quarters of your patients will have this recur. 
10 to 15 percent will have um, metastases, and that's with a wide local resection and negative margins. And 28 percent of patients will actually uh, succumb to this. So, dedifferentiated liposarc, always concerned when you have a retroperitoneal mass. Um, and don't be afraid to combine your markers to help you figure out what this is. Neuroectodermal lesions. So this is case seven, technically. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Pretty, um, looks pretty well circumscribed for the most part. Maybe there's infiltrated borders, maybe not, can't really say. Still um, kind of looks like everything we've seen today, right? A little, a little <laughs> more blue. A little more blue, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. All right, let's see what we have here. proliferation of these cells that are very um, they're not quite spindly but mm -hmm. maybe a little drawn out like they're kind of at this projection looks kind of like you know there's a nuclei and, and there's some cytoplasm mm -hmm. with it and well. there's a decent amount of cytoplasm and is it just me, or did this nucleus look a little eccentric? Maybe, Maybe. some of them. Yeah. And I don't uh, think the one thing that I'm, I want you definitely to get to, I don't think it's projecting too well. Okay. But it's hard to see in the more cellular areas as well. Okay. Let's move on to the less cellular areas. different so you said it's very blue mm -hmm. so what doesn't look blue what doesn't look blue but still definitely looks like lesion <laughs> um so obviously like not this stuff like no. this looks like normal yeah. tissue okay. all that? This thing? i thought that was just artifact whoa okay what do you think of that it's like melanin well, it's definitely pigment. pigment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that the? No. If this case didn't have this, I was seriously questioning myself. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. Is that? Is this one of those like? There's. I'm thinking of this one lesion, right? And I know that the name is very misleading, but I'm not sure if this one. Well, normally with these, uh, the histology makes a little more sense towards the name. In this case, not so much, but um, all that pigment really yeah. helps you. Okay. Because you have this lesion that sort of looks like maybe, um, like maybe like it's this weird spindle cell thing mm -hmm. with some epithelioid areas. Mm -hmm. um, and it has all this pigment, but it doesn't look like melanoma. Yeah. And I know, you know, the caveat that melanoma can look like anything, but melanoma does not look like this. <laughs> so, the thing I'm thinking, is it a clear cell sarcoma? Yes. Because I know that I was like, this is not clear. What is it's this? Like, like the opposite of clear. Yeah. Like, I, it's just one of those things where it's like, why? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is clear cell sarcoma, uh, and it's really, like I said, if I didn't have those areas of pigment, because there's two of them that are really strong, um, but the other areas that are pigmented within the cellular areas, it kind of looks more like hemocytorin, so I'm not uh, totally convinced of that, and then anywhere that you think it's kind of more clear, it just kind of looks like it's falling apart and wasn't well fixed. Um, so, for anyone who looks at the slides and doesn't watch the videos and doesn't ask me questions, they might be like, what? Really? Uh, <laughs> um, but the pigment really is I guess, yeah, it's sort of clear. Yeah, it kinda looks sort like, of. I mean, it looks like retraction artifacts more than yeah, anything. Yeah, so, I don't. <laughs> which, I mean, clear cells kind of are, but, you know, it's just... Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I don't know, just this. It's Yeah, it's the pigment that really helps you. So you have, like, this constellation of findings, and that's where it's supposed to... Um, push you. 
So even though I said this doesn't look like melanoma, what's a name that they like to use for it or used to use? Malignant melanoma soft parts. Um, but if you see enough melanomas, you know this kind of doesn't really look like melanoma. Anyway, a uh, wide range of patients can have it, 13 to 73, so it's almost like monopoly, you know, ages 9 to 99. Um, but the average is going to be a relatively young adult at 30 years old, and there's a slight male predominance. This tends to be uh, deep-seated, either in the extremities, the trunk, or uh, limb girdle, so you think um, deep soft tissue of either like the thigh, the, the hips, buttock, or shoulders, um, and it likes to occur near tendons, fascia, or aponeuroses. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind with lo location of lesion, um, since location and, and imaging is, is so important with bone soft tissue lesions. Overall, it's going to be nested with uh, spindled or epithelioid or giant cells that are separated by collagenous bands. And the collagenous bands are not necessarily super prominent. Uh, in the example that we had, they were um, somewhere in between prominent and delicate, uh, where they're definitely there, but they neither fit one or the other. Um, and our case was a little more spindly with some mixed epithelioid variants. Uh, and luckily for us, we had a whole bunch of melanin present, but two thirds of the cases will have it present. You can see uh, fluorite like giant cells. You can see rhabdoid cells. So where you were asking about eccentric cells, it's very likely that there's some in there. And you can also have these bizarre pleomorphic cells. And there's a few of them scattered in there, but not too many. Um, you may or may not have mitotic figures, um, but an average of four mitotic figures over 10 high power fields really isn't very high. And positive stains, so you want to think about your melanoma stains. So uh, melanin, HMB45, S100, uh, iron will also be positive in this, uh, just to add a little more complexity to all those stains. Of course, Vimentin's in there. Um, and your negative stains, uh, SMA, Desmond, and CAM5.2, or your keratins. Um, so for the clinician, these really are going to be relatively nondescript. Like you can see, it's a raised erythematous papule, um, but that fits a whole bunch of other uh, diseases, uh, disease entities. So imaging might be more helpful with that. Um, and grossly, it pretty much just looks like a relatively well circumscribed lipoma. Um, I think the the bottom picture looks a little more clear cellish, or a little easier to believe that's clear cellish. And uh, the inside, I think I have a little more pigment in there. Uh, molecular, so translocation 1222, which is your ATV1 or ATF1 and EWS, but usually they're diploid, so molecular may or may not be helpful, really. Um, if this is within the GI tract, since it can really occur anywhere, um, you'd be looking for the fusion of EWSR1 and CREB1. Uh, so that would help you if you have this lesion and you're wondering about, oh my gosh, am I dealing with some sort of melanotic lesion in the GI tract? Uh, so your differential is basically melanoma, uh, which won't have that translocation. Uh, they tend to have uh, aneuploidy, and especially when it, it metastasizes to soft tissue. Treatment, again, is going to be wide local excision. And if there's metastasis, then they'll add in chemotherapy. Five-year survival is 67%. Ten-year survival is 10%. So obviously when we're looking at someone who's like 30 years old and 20 years out, they're only 50. So those are relatively dismal odds. Um, and even though it has slow progression, the recurrence rate is relatively high and you often get metastases to lymph nodes. Um, and then similar to other sarcomas as well as other uh, GI lesions, uh, larger size, so greater than five centimeters, if there's necrosis or you have recurrence, as well as having a, a GI origin, those all pretend poor prognosis. Then we have just a few more pictures, so you can see that it doesn't always look clear, um, but the pigment is really what helps you. Case eight. Seems like 
a lot of the things we've seen already. <laughs> um, blue cells, pink background, infiltrative, not really any pattern and low power. So let's go on higher power and see what we're dealing with. Okay. Um, wow. Um, all right. Initial impression. <laughs> Initial impression. Not too exciting. It's, I mean, there are these cells that are kind of weird, so, you know, it's pushing you towards the malignant side of things. But otherwise, you know, you could say this is like just a, like, if you, if, let's say this area, for instance, and you say it's a benign spindle proliferation, I could believe you. Okay. But, um, I guarantee you've seen many lesions that look like this just aren't this. Mm-hmm. And you've probably seen them either in the frozen room. There's a lot of like or an autopsy. Collagen type. Is that collagen? Just well, fibro. It looks a little more fibrillary than yeah. it could be. Okay. Um Any cell of origin? Mm-hmm. Mm. I mean, it does look more spindly, so maybe like smooth muscle could be fibroblasts. Okay. Well, the phone-a-friend is the one who makes the presentation, so it's not really fair. <laughs> well, that's why I chose phone-a-friend, you see. <laughs> okay, um, so I would maybe suggest that some of these are a little more cigar-shaped. Maybe they're a little more wavy. Cigar, wavy. Cigar, the blunt cigar is the smooth muscles ones, right? The blunt cigar, but these are a little more tapered cigar, but... Um, or no, wait, I think I have that backwards. Um, yeah. Tapered spindle cells are more smooth muscle and then cigar shaped or something else. And either someone's going to agree with me or they're going to be like, oh my gosh, you don't know basic histology. I'm not watching your videos anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, um, But yeah, when I first saw this, uh -huh. I was like, oh, I put a blank in here, and then I was like, well, no, clearly it's not, <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's in with the uh, soft tissue sarcoma, yeah. but... It is, it is malignant, because we did see some really weird cells hiding in here. Yes. Um, I just say typical cells. Uh, Does it remind you of anything that you see maybe... Frequent, oh, do a a smear and freeze on in the frozen room. Like a neuropath. Like a neuropath. Tumor. Um. Does it remind you of anything? I don't know. GBM. Right. So this can look like GBM, but what I was going for actually was schwannoma. Um, oh. Um, <laughs> schwannoma, huh? Um, Most of it is relatively bland. Yeah, so. Yeah, I guess. Because uh, the true areas that look a little more GBM-y. I guess it's it. the malignant version because, yeah, this looks more... Right. Like, cell cytologically looks worse than... Yeah. Okay, it's a okay. schwannoma of some so sort. It's a malignant schwannoma, which also goes by what name? Do you know? Malignant schwannoma. Malignant. Okay, so remember it's bone soft tissue, so they like to be descriptive. So where do we find schwannomas? Like what what are wrapped they? around nerves? What kind of nerves? Peripheral nerves. Yeah. Peripheral 
nerve sheath. Mm-hmm. Per malignant per nerve sheath tumor. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> or MPNST, you know. I kind of like malignant schwannoma, but, uh, you know, we should be correct, so MPNST. Uh, <laughs> uh, some, somebody's probably shaking their head going, wow, that took you guys a long time to get there. That's okay. That's why we're here. Um, so this usually occurs in adults, and about half of them are associated with neurofibromatosis, okay? And yeah, so often they'll have either a ganglion aroma that preceded, or they'll have a history of being radiated in the area. Um, and these are malignant lesions, so they like to go to major nerves. So think neck, forearm, uh, buttocks with the sciatic nerve. Um, and obviously because they're involving the nerve sheath, they're going to be uh, very bulky tumors. So what you can see in the top picture on the right is uh, that entire bulging area in the anterior forearm. That is malignant peripheral, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. <laughs> um, and on my microscopy, they're actually, actually relatively monomorphic. They're slightly serpentine. Uh, they can have some palisading and uh, these large gaping vascular spaces, which there were some of them. I don't know how much I'd say large gaping, but there were definitely vascular spaces that were evident. Um, and right around the vessels, actually, what you'll see is the tumor cells, it looks a little more cellular, and the cells themselves are a little more plump, like the, the nuclei are, are bigger. Um, you should see geographic necrosis with uh, pulsing at the edges. We don't have edges of this tumor, and I really didn't appreciate geographic necrosis. There's some areas in the case that um, I included here where it's uh, fibrin deposition, uh, so just be aware of that. But basically, it should look like GBM on the outside of the lesion. Uh, you may or may not see pleomorphism or um, metaplasia. And you can have glandular differentiation just to complicate things. And you can also see melanin. And melanin is typically associated with if you are uh, near the spinal nerve root. Uh, so you'd want to think about a little bit of overlap with primary melanoma there. Um, and some of these cases will have no features that look like schwannoma. Our case definitely had features that look like schwannoma, so don't worry about that. Um, but if you don't see it, it doesn't mean it's non MPNSD. So your stains, we have a few more that can help you. Uh, collagen 4, S100, CD99, um, and uh, CD57 in uh, neurofibromatosis-like areas, okay? Note, nowhere on here is my mentin. Hallelujah. Uh, we don't have that on our case. For molecular, it's a translocation between the X chromosome and chromosome 18, um, and it should be actually negative for that? Okay, I need to figure out what I meant by that. Um, but your differential would include like EPS, or uh, malignant fibrocystocytoma, uh, pleomorphic liposarcoma, as well as synovial sarcoma. Um, synovial sarcoma probably looks the most similar to what we had in our case, and just like every other lesion that we've encountered that looks more malignant, you're going to have wide level excision, and they'll go with a comp they may or may not go with combination of chemo and radiation. And your ten year survival is not terrible, but it's not great either at a, between thirty five to fifty percent. Um, so what we have on the bottom inset is uh, the bottom right is showing you a little bit of that melanin pigment that you can see uh, and the top right and bottom left just kind of show you a little more how it can look more like the synovial sarcoma uh, or even like a UPS. I need to figure out what I meant by that translocation, other than saying it doesn't have that translocation. So I will figure that out and I will add an addendum to the video. Vascular lesions, case nine. Okay, um, giant ugly thing, thing here. 
Yes. Um, I think that's a tumor. <laughs> that is a tumor, and everything else is normal. Yes. <laughs> and um, it looks like it's infiltrating, even though it's relatively well circumscribed. So let's go up for a lot of view. What do we see? What do we see? Well, okay. Um, a lot of holes. What are these holes? Um, it kind of looks like there's tracts here. Okay. Kind of look like malformed blood vessels, sort of, with yeah. these weird cells going in there. Um, there's lots of channels. Um, is this a bloody specimen? Uh, they normally are. I would have liked to have seen a lot more blood in this specimen. Yeah, well, I'm, no, wait, is that no? Uh, yeah. But you've seen these before. I know you have because I've shown you a few of them. And there's even been a few in some of the here, review here, sessions, here, just non here, bone soft tissue. Here, here. Hmm. And um, so it's a vascular lesion. And I've seen these blood vessels. I think they're blood vessels. So I'm going to go up angiosarcoma. Okay. So when we said that uh, normally these are bloody lesions, so what would you have liked to have seen in this? I would like to see more red cells in these left spaces. More red cells, okay. Yeah, so that I'm not, you know, mistaking artifact for... Yeah, I think unfortunately a lot of this is artifact. Yeah. And then there's fat in between, yeah. which at first looks like lumen, but then it's not. Um, yeah, so obviously having red blood cells within the vessels would help. Because um, the capillaries have red blood cells in them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things though that would be really nice with this is uh, extraphysated red blood cells and blood links. Um, even though that tends to be associated with higher grade angiosarcs as well as uh, uh, secondary angiosarcs like related to, to breast, which is where you would have seen it. <laughs> I definitely would have shown you one in, in breast. Um, but to me this looks more high grade and this is definitely an angiosarc. Um, Okay. Yes. Uh, so these are rare lesions in older adults, extremely rare in children and young adults, and your risk factors, chronic lymphedema, radiation, sun exposure, PVC, thorough trust. Um, if you guys have listened to my videos for, for very long, you've probably heard me repeat these things at nauseum. Uh, so they tend to occur if they're primary to the skin, scalp and face, if lymphedema is involved, then you want to think upper extremities or breast, but really angiosarc can occur anywhere. Um, early on, they tend to be small, well demarcated red nodules, and they're relatively indescript. Later on, again, they get that fish flesh, gray-white lesion. Um, they tend to be hemorrhagic. They may have necrosis, and they are uh, invasive lesions, so it can be very hard to skirt around them because what's maybe just related to uh, the bleeding associated with lesion versus the actual lesion, and is it field effect secondary to uh, some exposure or radiation, in which case it can be a nightmare to get around. Okay, so what do we have? You should have a typical vascular spaces, um, a variable grade, but if the patient has been irradiated, then you're looking for high grade nuclei. And what do we mean by high grade? They should be um, relatively pleomorphic, scary, uh, high. Uh, NC ratio. Um, you can see multinucleated cells that uh, may or may not have hyaline globules, and if they have the, those hyaline globules, that's your alpha 1 antitrypsin or alpha 1 antihymotrypsin, um, and often that'll be involving sub subcutaneous tissue. Uh, you can have solid areas, which our lesion was generally more solid, um, and with those, they tend to have uh, intracytoplasmic lumina that are filled with RBCs. Um, you, again, you can have the extravasated red blood cells or the blood lakes, and that's also often associated with radiation or secondary induced angiosarcoma. 
Um, mitoses should be relatively brisk, and brisk means lots of them. You shouldn't have to hunt for them. They should pretty much be everywhere, um, and you can also see necrosis. Positive stains, so I'll, uh, vascular lesions, so you want the vascular markers, so uh, flea one, factors uh, eight, CD31, thrombomodulin, CD34, um, C kit, so C kit's one to keep in mind um, because that's a little different. Anyway, we're not have something like your VEGFR3. For molecular, uh, th these lesions have MIC amplifications and your differential. Obviously, you're going to include things like is this just hemangioma? Is it a typical vascular lesion or a typical hemangioma? Uh, is it just a vascular proliferation? Is it, again, there's your UPS, your undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma? It, that is everywhere today. And how do they treat it? Well, they're going to excise it and they're going to try to excise with clear margins, but sometimes that's just not possible. Uh, prognosis your five year survival is 35% if they do not have any metastases. Um, and METs to lymph nodes occur in 14% of cases, and that is extremely high for sarcoma. Um, so METs to lymph nodes at 14%, they can also metastasize to lung, liver, bone. Um, so terrifying, terrifying lesion, and one to keep in mind when you uh, have had this history of all oh, your patients been, uh, let's say they had Hodgkin's lymphoma when they were a kid and they received uh, full chest radiation, well, they could develop an angiosarcoma later on. So uh, something to keep in, in mind when you're doing, uh, when you're looking at cases is looking at the history to see what they had previously because sometimes that will give you the answers. Lesions of uncertain histiogenesis, or histogenesis, sorry. Um, so our last couple of cases, case 10. Okay. Um some sort of tumor, <laughs> bloody, yes. not very blue. Um, ooh, ooh, I know this one. You know this one? It's Great. Funny because I had one of these cases. In a that 13 always year helps, doesn't 13 it? 13 or 17 year old. So oh, no. I'm yeah. seeing the, and it was a current one too, in the thigh. Um, so yeah, major feature, kind of like these sort of nests of cells that are separated by septa. The cells kind of look like has a lot of cytoplasm, kind of granular. I don't know. I just this looks like corn to me for some reason. I always they say they always look like they're falling apart too. Corn, yeah, falling apart corn. Like, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> you know when you get those loose corns. Yeah. So this is an alveolar soft part sarcoma. It's a very distinct yes. morphology. All right. Anything else you can tell us about the morphology? Well, over here. Um, if not, I can take over. You can take over. Okay. <laughs> all right, so rare. So the fact that you've seen one and they account for less than 1% of all soft tissue tumors, that's pretty cool. Um, they tend to occur in young adults, so your 17-year-old having a uh, current lesion, a bit on the younger side. But uh, again, whenever I say, like, hey, pay attention to when we have changes in, like, sex discrepancies or age discrepancies, this is one that occurs in females more than males. My patient was a female. There you go. Mm -hmm. Uh, so these tend to occur either deep soft tissue of the oral cavity, pharynx, mediastinum, or the lower extremity, and you said thigh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they are generally well circumscribed, gray yellow mass, so again, that fish flesh type appearance or sort of fatty type appearance, depending on how much of one or the other uh, you got going on or who's describing it. Um, they tend to have hemorrhage in areas of necrosis, and their size can range anywhere from about 2 centimeters to 14 centimeters. Um, and as was mentioned, they tend to form these well-defined nests, but they're discohesive. So it looks like all the cells are just falling out of everything. And the nest should be separated by these fibrous stroma. And generally, I would say like, uh, even though the picture I have is a little more robust, in, in our example, they were a little more delicate. Um, the cells are relatively large and, and polygonal. Uh, and they have this granular eosinophilic cytoplasm, which again kind of gives it this appearance like it's not well fixed um, or that the, the cells are just falling apart. Um, the nuclei tend to be vesicular and you'll, you should see prominent nucleoli. Um, often you'll have LVI or lymphovascular invasion and they tend to have these rod or needle shaped 
crystalloids in them, which are highlighted by PAS, and I have a picture to show you of those. Um, that you don't really see mitoses, and you shouldn't really have pleomorphism either. It's just it's going to have these irregularly uh, shaped cells, but they're going to be, for the most part, round-ish. Um, but the nuclei should be relatively small and, and regular. Oh no, it's thinking. It's the time, that time of the day. It's know. that time of the day, I know. And <laughs> Every, get, it happens quite often around this time. <laughs> I'm trying to get you up before seven today, so. There's nothing I can do, it's loading. It means I get to edit. Ha, ha, ha. Ah, there we go. Okay, so for a stains, uh, your PAS is gonna highlight those crystalloids, so you can see from the, the inset that I added in that uh, that's what the crystalloids look like. Um, they're not really evident on the h and &E. I did try searching for them, but um, when something's not prominent, I don't feel it's fair to make you go hunt for it. Um, and I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Technical difficulty. Oh, oh. Uh, there, no. No, just wait. Okay. Uh -huh. There we go. There, I fixed it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so your myo-D1 should be cytoplasmic, so keep that in mind. So if you're seeing myo-D1 as nuclear, that's not the right type of staining, as well as your TFE3. For molecular, you can have a chromosome 17 Q25 anomaly, and that pretends a poor prognosis, okay? So when things relate to prognosis, that means you must do them. So if you're like, okay, I definitely have an alveolar soft part sarcoma, um, and I know that's what it is, we don't have to do molecular, right? No, in this instance, you'd want to do molecular. You could even try doing a focused molecular assay um, to hunt for that chromosome 17 anomaly um, because that would affect the patient's prognosis overall. Uh, your differential, so alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, which I had a really hard time saying earlier uh, in this session, as well as metastatic lesions, granular cell tumor because of the granular nature of the cytoplasm, as well as periganglioma. Uh, your treatment would be excision and radiation, so notice we're not going to do chemotherapy in this, but you're going to take it out and you're going to radiate the area. So your five-year survival, if it's localized, is 87%, which is fantastic. But if they have metastases, that drops dramatically to 20%. And these patients can develop metastases decades later. Um, so, you know, let's say we have the patient who had the recurrent alveolar soft part sarcoma in the thigh at 17. Well, 30 years later, okay, so now they're 47, 50 years old. Um, their parent and now they have metastases to their lungs and um, that would have a very poor prognosis there. And something that's interesting to note with this sarcoma though is that the initial presentation may even be that they have metastases to the lung. So if you have- That was our case. Like, that was your case? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's not uncommon for that to happen where it's like there's no obvious mass lesion anywhere and they're like, oh, like thinking maybe they have a pneumonia or something, and they do a chest x-ray, and it's all these metastatic lesions. Um, so this is definitely one to know. This is, it has so many different elements between uh, prognostic indications and just a, t a totally different look from a lot of the other sarcomas that we've seen today. Uh, this is definitely one to, to study and know uh, on site. <laughs> yes. And our last case, case 11. Okay, well, low power looks like any of our other case, many of our other cases. Yeah, they have a theme. Non-descript infiltrative bluish tinged thing. Um, so let's go on higher power. Let's so look around. What are these cells we're dealing with? Just pick a random spot. Huh. So it's kind of streamy. It's kind of hard to tell. Some of these cells look a little more plumper mm -hmm. like here maybe that's maybe more epithelioid but then there is these cells that look a little more spindly right it's kind of like a mix between spindly and plump can i get a clue on roughly where this is coming from uh so this is a 40 year old male and we have, this is 
Um, let's say this mass involves the back of the hand. Back of the hand. Uh, One of the things that'll help you is if you go a little lower power. What does the general appearance look like to you? Like, just stop right here. So. If you didn't know I, that this was sarcoma up here, for sure, mm -hmm. what does so, this look like? Okay, so is this, first question, is this part of the lesion? This, it's this all part, the lesion. It's all lesion. Okay, so then I would say this kind of looks like a granuloma. It kind of does, right? on the outside and this sort of, you know, nondescript right. thing, fibrous thing in the middle. Yeah. And, and basically everything in the middle is basically dead. Dead, so. yeah. Um, so, I mean, looking, like I mentioned, there's these cells that look kind of more epithelioid, but there's mm -hmm. also these, like, you know, spindle-like cells. The, um, yeah, um, so, can it be like an epithelioid sarcoma? It sure could. Mm -hmm. In fact, that is what this is. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> and the granuloma type appearance is really what helps you. And um, But obviously, as soon as you zoom in, you realize you're not dealing with a granuloma. Mm -hmm. And the location kind of helps you a little bit, too. A little bit. Okay, so classic type versus proximal type. Uh, you have age differences. So those would be relatively easy things for them to ask about. Both are have a slight male predominance. Uh, and they're slow growing painless masses. Um, so if this was on the foot, and let's say it's on the foot of a diabetic patient, you might think, oh, this is just, you know, a, an ulcer, like a, a chronic wound that's not healing. Um, and they're, they are very slow growing and they are painless, so uh, it might not raise any flags for a little while. Um, they tend to occur on the distal extremity. So I said that I gave the uh, scenario that this was a hand mass in a 40 year old um, but they will also occur on the wrists and the fingers as well um, they do involve your reticular dermis and sometimes your deep soft tissue uh, so think back to our other lesions that like to involve the fascial planes aponeuroses as well as uh, tendons um, so that's where these things like to stay and as you can see from the picture I have up top which think looks like a heel. Uh, they are ulcerated fleshy lesions with necrosis and they're relatively poorly defined. Um, so the classic uh, distal type, which is far more common, um, has epithelioid like cells and that granuloma type pattern. Um, there will be uh, necrosis and central hyalinization. Now our case didn't really have so much of the hyalinization. It was starting it was starting that process, um, but it definitely had that central necrosis and granuloma type pattern. The tissue itself, it, uh, the cells are relatively acidophilic and there may be some desmoplasia. It was kind of hard to appreciate desmoplasia in the example I gave, I think in part because it is quite cellular in, in the viable areas. Uh, again, involving the reticular dermis, and you may or may not see rhabdoid type cells. And the proximal type is far more likely to have rhabdoid cells, so that should also be moved over because the rhabdoid cells are common with the proximal type, but you do not have that granuloma type arrangement. So you're going to be relying on having those really epithelioid type cells, uh, rhabdoid cells, and you can still like have the reticular dermis involvement. Um, but you're not going to have that granuloma type appearance. So staying so Vimentin's back, it uh, went goodbye for a little bit and it's made its appearance again. Um, so CD34, Flea1, ERG, uh, sometimes you see CD31. Uh, so that sounds a lot like our angiosarcoma. So EMA could be really helpful there. Negative stain, so factor eight, which is something that you would see with uh, your angiosarc, uh, SMARC B1, uh, if you were thinking about like the, uh, the NE1 pathway, 
uh, molecular is relatively complicated, so I put the most common uh, gains and deletions there. And obviously, if SMARCB1 uh, is deleted, um, that is something else that would be there. And SMARCB1 is chromosome 22, Q11 to Q12. Um, so your differential, so you'd uh, think about things like granuloma annulare, uh, or just granulomatous inflammation, uh, again, because involvement of the reticular dermis and the location of the lesion. You'd also want to think about squamous cell carcinoma, right? If you have this patient that comes in, they've had this chronic wound that's painless uh, on their heel or hand or, or wherever, and it's uh, slowly growing and it's sort of heaped and ulcerated, then you would want to think about squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, epithelioid angiosarc, like we mentioned before, as well as um, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Uh, and the picture on top, uh, this is epithelioid sarcoma involving the thumb. So again, involving the fingers, the hand, wrist, um, and you can see how destructive that lesion is. Um, so the treatment for these is wide local excision and radiation. So in the case above, that patient would likely lose their thumb. Um, and depending on if anything else went or complications post-op, they might actually end up losing that hand. Um, prognosis, five-year survival, 60-80%, so that's actually pretty good. However, anywhere from 40 to 75% are going to recur, and almost half of them are going to metastasize to, to either lymph nodes or lung. So almost a third of patients will actually die from this disease. Um, so again, this is one of those, something that you should recognize uh, on site, uh, be, given that the most common presentation is the classic type and has that granulomatous type appearance. Um, this really isn't something that, that should be missed. Um, okay, so that's your epithelial sarcoma. So that's what we have for this week. There's 18 cases in the challenge cases, so some of these will be recapitulations of things that we saw today. Uh, some of them might be entities that are uh, within the handouts I gave. On the back of the handout, um, I actually went over the, uh, the grading system, the uh, French Federation of Cancer Center Sarcoma Group, or FFCCSG. Uh, so that's in the handout. Um, Again, if you like this video, please hit like. If you aren't subscribed, hit subscribe. Uh, if you have comments, uh, things to help us out because we messed up one feature or another, or we missed features, or you maybe you have uh, a helpful thing to help out uh, remembering things, like how I remember the collagen fibers in uh, adult fibrosarcoma. Um, Really, I, I love hearing everything from everybody. Uh, I'm trying to incorporate ideas where I can. Sometimes I'm asked for things that I, on services I don't really cover. Uh, so those videos are a little slower going. But uh, that's what we have. So next week we'll be back with our malignant bone lesions or our osteosarcomas. Um, and uh, hope to see you guys then. Uh, if I can get the mouse, so let's just see if we have any questions. Okay, so I don't see anything in here. And yes, for anyone who hasn't joined our group, I do tend to put relatively the same welcome message as well as the links to the slides. Um, but okay, since we have no questions, that's what we have for this week. This video will be posted Friday morning as per usual. And we will see you all next week.